Welcome to week 5 of nur the Nursing Leadership and Management course. Uh, the lecture for this week uh, will discuss the topic related to strategic planning and goal settings, a change, quality and risk, and translating research into practice. By the end of this uh, lecture, the student will be able to describe the importance of environmental assessment, explain the planning process, outline the purpose and mission, uh, statement, a philosophy, goal, and objectives, describe goal setting and strategic planning, describe the process of strategic planning and establishing an entrepreneurial business in the healthcare field, and explain the importance of marketing plans in the health field, healthcare field. What is strategic planning? It's a process designed to encompass the organization's emphasis on mission statement, strategic action plan, change in politics and procedures, environmental factors, development of new service. The strategic planning process involves assessment of the environment, appraisal of organization strengths and weaknesses, identification of major opportunities and threats, development of strategies to meet these opportunities, implementation and evaluation of the strategy. Now, in the assessment of the environment, let's look at the external environment. In the external environment, the assessment of impact of opportunities and threats within the environment. For example, economic and demographic factors. In the internal environment, is a review uh, uh, effectiveness of an organization, like the structure, size, and human resources. Identification of the organization's strengths and weaknesses requires uh, understanding the mission statement, the philosophy, goals, and objectives of the organization. Strategies as identify, identifying of the strategies involve uh, identifying major issues, establishing goals, and developing strategies to meet goals. Implementation and evaluation of strategies, strategic planning, and evaluation. Evaluation entails a review of strategic plan to determine whether the goals, objectives, and activities are on target. Uh, specific plans for action or implementation include open communication staff, formulation of, of revised policies and procedures, and formulation of area and individual objectives. Marketing involves activities designed to generate and facilitate exchanges, exchanges intended to satisfy human wants and needs. Marketing planning process is a, uh, as follows. Assessment, planning, implementation, and evaluation. In assessment, uh, you need to determine organizational level mission, objective, and goals. Analyze organizational strengths and weaknesses. Analyze external threats and opportunities in setting market mission objectives and goals. And planning uh, involves development of a marketing plan and plan outline, which would have a service or program to be provided, detailed budget cost analysis, cost analysis and promotional activities designed to promote the program. And the implementation of the marketing plan within the process involves establishment of programs and activities designed to communicate benefits of the service or program to patients. Forms of promotion include media releases, brochures, and uh, pamphlets. And the evaluation phase of the marketing process involves assess the reasons why clients are not using the service programs or products and be aware that procedures may include satisfaction surveys and interviews with clients. In summary, the effectiveness of any organization depends on strategic planning and 
marketing. The planning process is necessary to survive ongoing change and restructuring the healthcare system. Marketing strategies play a vital role in healthcare settings to provide services and programs to the public. Next, we are going to look at two types of change and how learning organizations can move ahead with changes that benefit nurses and patients, uh, patients alike. The idea for change takes on a new intensity and requires considerable work. First, let's look at the uh, um, objectives for this topic. At the end of this discussion, uh, you'll be able to analyze general characteristics of change in open system organizations, relate the models of plan change to the process of low-level change, relate nonlinear theories to managing high-level change, evaluate the use of selected functions, principles, and strategies in initiating and managing change, and finally formulate desirable qual qualities of effective change agents. Planned change is a slow methodological approach that is viewed as linear. Planned change typically deals with predictable changes such as determining how to educate all staff on the use of new piece of equipment. The second type of uh, change is nonlinear or complex change. Nonlinear refers to uh, refers more to a web. In other words, everything is connected in the nonlinear. Pulling on one piece, move other piece so that a new pattern appears. Most change in healthcare is complex because it involves many people and clinical uh, and organizational changes. A common way to view plan change is to use Lewin's force field analysis. This analysis allows us to look at all elements in a situation to determine what barriers we must overcome and how quickly a change can occur. Barriers and facilitators can refer to elements of the change, such as gaining information, securing funding, and having needed equipment, including technology. They can also refer to people or groups of people. Although each situation has to be analyzed, some common barriers exist for almost every change. The first is budget. If the, bu if the, if the change doesn't save money, at least in the long run, it will be difficult to secure support from administrators who have a key accountability for costs. Equipment may merely be focused on accessibility, but it also may involve purchases. If the equipment has a high degree of unreliability that then consumes important staff time, the, ch the chances for the change being adopted are diminished. People who value status quo and are fairly averse to change are typically barriers to change. To convert them to being at least neutral takes effort on the part of group leaders. Often people who have preferred the status quo see no benefits to themselves to take an, uh, on the uh, proposed change. Finally, groups who see the change as a threat are not supportive and if their numbers are sufficient, they become a powerful opponent. Sometimes the reason a group opposes change is because they see the change as eroding their turf and power. These are difficult challenges to take on. Other times, they oppose change because it has not been described adequately, especially in terms of patient care benefits. Some of the common facilitators include many elements. The most basic facilitator is data, but it alone doesn't convince all the changes needed. A second facilitator exists when there is com community support. For example, 
during the hospital expansion project, the surrounding areas are often disadvantaged. But if that community sees there will be fewer traffic issues and better access, they often are engaged in supporting the change. One of the key elements of facilitation exists when there is a buy-in by the physicians and nurses. These two groups are key to big changes that occur within a healthcare organization. Most importantly, however, is the driver for any change, patient safety. If the benefit to patients is clear, it is easier to obtain buy-in from important groups including physicians, nurses, and the community. The second type of change is nonlinear or complex change. Think back to the figure of this change. The interchange between what is happening within the organization with what is happening external to the organization shapes both changes. For example, Think back to the example I gave about a hospital expansion program. I said the community had bought into the change because they saw the end results. Now think what would happen if there were some major delays or an explosion occurred on site or there was publicity about the way in which the building expansion was being funded. Suddenly, the community isn't so supportive. Now, the organizational re representatives are spending more of their time managing external relationships than they are moving the project itself ahead. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, the group that has addressed saving 100,000 lives per year through better safety measures, also has forced has worked on a project called Transforming Care at the Bedside. Think of this as small change projects that are based on nonlinear change. This work is designed to support direct care nursing staff in making inside cha uh, instant change when they see better say, ways to provide care on medical surgical units. Rather than following the traditional plan change approach where an idea circulates through numerous communities, the policy and procedures are carefully worded and the supporting data have been pooled. This initiative allows for the translation of research and changes in systems to occur almost instantly so that patients benefit immediately from ideas that suggested suggest care is provided in a better way. The spread effect, meaning the translation of the new way uh, th uh, throughout the organization, occurs through the traditional committee. The change then is one where the committee is formalizing the existing practice. Are you in a learning organization? Peter Senege say that there are five disciplines that an organization must engage in to be a true learning organization. The five critical disciplines we must engage in throughout an organization are these. First is systems thinking. Each of us must think of must think of the organization as a living entity and know that what one of us does affects the organization. The organization has a set of values that are lived out and support personal mastery. Two is personal mastery. Systems are in place that help all of us learn so that we are all well informed in order to provide care patient seeking. Third are mental mod uh, models. Each of us operates on certain values, beliefs, and assumptions. For example, as I assume my car will start in the morning so I can get to work. Organizations have similar assumptions. For example, that people want to do their best that employees value patients and that work that they do on their behalf. 
These are mental models. Fourth is assured vision. When the mental models of assumptions, values, and beliefs are examined and common ground is established, we have created assured understanding. Moving that to the future in a unified manner uh, is the way in which your visions are established. Finally, the fifth discipline is team learning. This refers to a cohesive group sharing learning experiences so that each individual benefits the other. This exchange results in more dramatic outcomes. Change agents and followers. Irrespective of the role of an, an individual holds in an organization, each person is either leading a change or supporting a change, or being an obstructionist. It may be useful uh, to be an obstructionist if you cannot see the change as beneficial. Once uh, you are clear, however, that the change is positive, you are either the agent or the follower, and those two roles may be fluid. For example, when the nurse manager is present, you may be the follower. When you are working with a precept team, you may be an agent. Change requires a group of people working together to be effective. Now, uh, we're going to discuss the next topic for this lecture. Uh, this topic is about managing quality and risk. The objectives for this topic is applying quality management principles to clinical situations, use the six steps of the quality improvement process, incorporate the roles of leader, manager, and followers to create a quality management culture of continuous readiness, and applying risk management strategies to an agency, agency's quality management program. Let's look at this case study. A significant increase in patient falls resulting in injury has been reported in, on your uh, unit. In accordance with the National Patient Safety Goals, you are assigned to a multidisciplinary quality improvement risk management team to address the problem. Steps in the risk management process. So, what are these steps? Define high risk situations, which in this case is the patient fault. Determine frequency of faults. Intervene and investigate, identifying the opportunities to improve care using steps of the quality improvement uh, process. So, let's look at the steps in the quality improvement process. First is identifying the needs, which will include compliance with national safety goals, redu reduction of hospital risk financial loss, reduction in length of stay, LOS, after an adverse fall event, improved patient outcomes, and, uh, and the assembled multi multidisciplinary team uh, which will be assembling a team of nurses, physicians, pharmacists, quality improvement or risk management experts, facility environment management representatives, then uh, collect the data relevant to uh, incidents, uh, define incidents of falls, determine higher risk patients uh, like age, mental status, history of falls, medication, physician environment, select and implement a plan, and then evaluate your plan. For the outcomes and uh, indicators, uh, education of 100% of a direct care providers, uh, completion of fall risk assessments on 100% of the patients, reduction in patient falls by 25% within the three months uh, program, uh, medical record demonstrating 100% compliance with full prevention program, then establishing prevention pr uh, plan which uh, consistent use of ID bracelets, implementation of bed alarms, uh, staff education like toilet uh, thing at risk patients routinely, 
change of environment like vertical grab bars, maybe. And evaluation uh, uh, phase of the process, of the quality improvement process, would be change in incidence of fall, examples through incident reports, and tenure event monitoring, a root cost analysis, a staff compliance with fall prevention plan, the patient family a satisfaction with the plan, and reliability and validity of fall risk assessment tools using reliable tools. Some of the standards of care for fall preventions, implementing some of these standards uh, that comes from the Nursing Practice Act, uh, might come from professional organizational guidelines, some of these standards. Uh, some of these standards are from institutional guidelines like policies and procedures. Uh, research and base are based on evidence-based practice guidelines and use standards from accreditation standards like the Joint Commission. Um, ab abiding by the national uh, patient safety goals, which include patient identification, communication among caregivers about the incidents, uh, controlling uh, the high-risk medications, utilization of infusion pump, uh, the risk of health care association infections, uh, use of accurate medication across continuum, and uh, preventing patient falls. The risk management malpractice, like duty, uh, the relocation, damage, and direct cost duty is the nurse has responsibility to patients. So duty refers to the patient, uh, to the nurse responsibility to the patient. The relocation, uh, the relocation uh, refers to the nurse who did not carry out duty. Uh, damage, or when the patient was injured, and direct cause is uh, injury uh, when uh, secondary to the nurse's failure to carry out duty. 